Kirby Ingalls, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thank you very much for having me. I, I really do appreciate it. Yeah, I'm super excited to have a conversation with you. You have a really interesting background, and I invite listeners to get connected with you on LinkedIn and find out more about what you've been up to. Mm-hmm. Um, but today we're going to be focusing on an aspect of what you you do in your coaching, uh, and that is developing genuine relationships. And I thought focusing specifically on relationships within the workplace and how those drive personal and organizational success would make for a really interesting conversation. Um, before we dive on into that conversation, I just wanted to share a brief portion of Kirby's bio with everybody. Kirby Ingalls provides high potential, busy corporate professionals with results driven, laser focused coaching in 30 minute sessions. His big picture and high and highly creative problem solving approach with an open and enthusiastic style turns you into a productive, inspiring and successful leader. Kirby has 25 years in leadership and human capital consulting, hosts the True Success podcast, and is a U.S. Army combat veteran. He advocates for the fatherless and raises awareness through running ultra marathons, memorializing heroes who lost their lives to PTSD. Uh, And I could go on and on and on. Uh, What an amazing background. Ultra marathons, that's something that I just can't even wrap my head around. I, I, I can barely run a 5K, you know, so the thought of, of uh, running a half marathon, a full marathon, or, or an ultra marathon blows my mind, but um, good for you, and uh, thank you again for joining me. Yeah, no problem, Jonathan. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's wonderful. Um, thank you for that you know, wonderful introduction. Um, it's been quite a journey, and, you know, a lot of the things that uh, you mentioned, you know, like the ultra marathon. Um, and some of the other things have really kind of helped develop me um, as, a, as a human being, um, but also helped me kind of put a lesson or a story to a lot of the things that I, that I work with that I hope I can share with you guys today. Yeah, great. Well, before we dive into the conversation, is there anything else that you would like to share by way of personal background or context to help frame our conversation? Yeah, you know, I mean, other than, you know, today's Veterans Day, and I think the most important thing for me, you know, uh, out of today for for that is, is you know, the, the, the sacrifice that goes into a lot of what those folks do, because this is, you know, it's Veterans Day, the day we're recording this, um, and I actually, you know, I had many years of, of service there. Uh, my For, for me, uh, patriotism is a huge thing for me and my family, and I'll, I'll kind of hit on that a little bit, because I can trace my ancestry you know all the way back to prior to uh, uh the revolutionary war uh, my family came to this country um you know and helped uh, they were pioneers and uh you know just kind of um been a part of you know the birth of this nation you know they were over here prior to 1747 they established a farm near blacksburg virginia in uh, 1747 and uh, they were a part of the French and Indian War, the American Revolutionary War, you know, and so on and so forth, you know, for, for years, uh, you know, I had two family members that fought in the Civil War, um, you know, and just throughout that, my grandfather was in World War II. So it is just, you know, and for me to, you know, have that time and have that opportunity, you know, it's really uh, comes from a place of calling and a sense of duty and to do that. And I find that it's an extremely important thing in our professions as well. Uh, to pursue those things that we feel called to. Uh, and we can really actually kind of get to your point, you know, in the conversation today is having those authentic and genuine relationships. Because when I think you can show up and, and you know, fulfill your passions and your desires and your purpose, uh, a lot of that really comes out very naturally. So, Yeah, wonderful. Well, thank you uh, for your service. Um, it is suiting, you know, that we, we have this opportunity to have a conversation <laughs> on Veterans Day. And uh, I have many veterans in my life that I'm so appreciative of, and I appreciate your service. And hearing you talk about your family history a little bit um, is also super interesting. Um, I don't, it's something I'm not sure I've ever shared on the podcast before, um, but we've traced our, our family history back quite a ways as well. And, and uh, I have ancestors that came over on the Mayflower and other pilgrim ancestors in the 1600s that helped to settle um, and really kind of the continual move west in across the country um, for the first several hundred years. You know, my family was on this continent. Um, they helped to continue to push the frontier uh, west. So it's just a super interesting, um, you know, way of understanding, uh, you know, 
our roots and where where we come from and where, how that influences where we're at now. Uh, I think all that fits in with understanding ourselves, understanding others, and and creating those those genuine relationships. Yeah, yeah, I would 100% agree with you. Uh, I think it really gives kind of, for me, you know, and as you mentioned, a renewed sense of purpose, you know, understanding the challenges and the hardships and times that, uh, you know, my family members have came through and what certain spots in history that they were a part of. And it kind of helps to build a little bit of an identity, you know, and what, what I find it, uh, extremely important. And those are the things that uh, I have to embrace and help pass that on to my children so they can kind of understand the importance of the impact that they can have on the world. Uh, and I don't think, you know, uh, you know, there's, there's a point in our lives where we can have too much reflection, right? But if there's just the right amount for the right things, you know, we're, if we're always looking back, then we're maybe never moving forward. But if we look back in that rearview mirror, uh, one of the things I like to tell people is the rearview mirror is very small. So we glance back and we can see the past, remember the past, you know, and, and gain some type of understanding. But the windshield in, is, is large and it's in front of us and you know, it's wide and it's clear and that's where our future's at. So I think that some of that stuff kind of helps build a little bit of our identity and helps propel us forward and have an appreciation of the things that people have opened up for us and to where we are today. Um, and to be, you know, extremely grateful for that uh, and have gratitude um for for the challenges and struggles that they came through because i will tell you um uh, i can't imagine to being where i'm at today if it wasn't for them and it's really hard for me to even um not be grateful for that because of you know the i mean even being in the military i've seen so many people make so many sacrifices and you know so I've seen some very challenging times and gone through some very challenging times you know i served in uh 2007 i was in the triangle of death in iraq and so that was an incredible time. And to see the personal sacrifices people made to serve something that was bigger than themselves, you know, it wasn't about them, but it was about, you know, freedom and preserving the American way of life. And when they showed up and, and they owned that, you know, it was, it, it's just something that will move you. And then for a couple, four years, I was at Arlington Cemetery. I was stationed there. Um, and to see, you know, the honor and respect paid to the fallen and those that had come before us and paved the way really um, it is an extraordinary feeling. And it's a very, very beautiful place to go to. And I can't think of any other place that's, you know, somebody would want to be laid to rest there. So I think, you know, going back to that earlier conversation about Veterans Day, you know, that's the kind of meaning and sense of purpose that it really builds upon. Uh, and that's kind of why I'm doing what I am today. You know, I want to impart that onto other people and try to have that impact. Yeah, purpose, identity, calling. I, I think that you sum it up really quite well uh, with those three words. And it's it's so essential that we understand ourselves well enough to to be able to define our own identity, how that drives mm -hmm. the purpose and the calling that we feel like we have in our lives and whether that that comes from a military um, purpose um, or you know what you name it like there's so many different meaningful ways that people can can uh, can better the world uh, and and drive meaning and and help those around them through that personal calling they feel uh, in their lives both personally and professionally uh, it's an incredibly powerful thing um, so let's let's talk a little bit about how those three connect. So um, having purpose, identity, and calling, how does that connect to creating genuine relationships? Uh, and we can talk about genuine genuine personal relationships as well, but but also specifically within the workforce. And I think you know in the military, this is something that I think they do exceptionally well um, in in creating these really tight knit uh, relationships where people trust and rely on each other. Um, and, and you rely on that, um, you know, to, to help your unit be successful. Um, but we can translate that into any organization, really. It's not something that has to be unique to, yeah. to military. Yeah, so you talked about the connection and the relationships that people have and the, the, the willingness to do incredible things that you probably wouldn't ask anybody else to do, but these men and women trust their leaders 
uh, in order to uh, accomplish this mission, uh, which are, are really can put their lives and, and other people's lives in danger. Um, and you really have to develop a, a, a powerful, powerful relationship. And there's two things uh, I'll talk about. And one is the blind trust. Uh, and the other one is the earned trust. And so there's two. Uh, <clears throat> and the earned trust uh, is kind of twofold. It's the, the earned trust because of what you've done, what you achieved, and you've been put in certain leadership positions. So you uh, embrace a certain amount of responsibility. By nature of that position, now you have this responsibility. You've been entrusted to it based off of your performance and your potential and other factors. Uh, the, the, the other fold of that is, is that you earn the trust of the people that are around you. And it has everything to do with character, how you conduct yourself, how you present yourself, how you speak, uh, your level of knowledge and understanding of what's going on, your ability to, and this gets to that authentic relationship piece, is valuing the opportunity not only for yourself to grow, to help others grow and learn and value each other. Uh, we spend a lot of time, you know, with diversity and inclusion, going through courses and classes and getting to know each other and trying to understand, you know, doing things like um, uh, uh, observation months where we go and we learn about things, you know, hear different speakers, uh, we dabble into different topics, you know, and I think that's really important when we can embrace that understanding and build that trust and have that, as well as this team building exercises, you know, we go through that process to where we learn to trust the guy on our right to do their job. And we trust the guy that our left to do their job. And I say guys as a, as a universal, you know, term, uh, I'm from the Midwest and I always say guys, but I mean everybody, um, because there's men and women just as equally and important to our left and right. And, you know, we, we get into those positions, but it's about repetition. We go through those exercises. We go through those trainings. You know, it's hard. And sometimes it gets old. It gets boring after all because you do it over and over and over. But you learn to trust that everybody's going to do exactly what they need to do in the moment because of the rehearsals. And at the time, that's, un, you know, not, not very fun. The other thing is authority. So we're all granted in the military authority. And some people, you know, even in a corporate setting or any other setting, have been granted a certain amount of authority. I have the authority to, you know, for example, maybe hire or fire, uh, you know, or make certain decisions. And so in the military, you've given that by rank. And that's kind of the, the blind trust. You know, when, when a young soldier, uh, man or woman comes in and they see this sergeant or this staff sergeant or drill sergeant or first sergeant or sergeant major or officer, there's a certain level of authority that's associated with that rank. And so there's that blind trust and they know that like, okay, well, they're here at this point in their career and you have that kind of that, that blind trust. And sometimes that goes wrong. And I'm not going to deny that there has been some times, you know, where that authority we got was too much for a particular person, you know, they got wrong or, you know, somebody made mistakes along the way that happens in every aspect of life, you know, uh, whether it, be the business setting or in your personal life you probably know somebody that was given some authority and they messed it up you know because it got to them you know they weren't able to handle it or they didn't have the right people and relationships around them to help them grow and mature into that position most of us are put in positions that we can't handle and we have the potential but we haven't actually mastered that level yet and it's when in the military when you reach that level of mastery that's when they thrust you into the next position that you're not ready for, but you have the potential to thrive and, and master and achieve excellence. Yeah, yeah. I, I think we, we're all, like you said, we're all in that that same boat where we're battling imposter syndrome, you know, because we're mm -hmm. constantly in stress, not in stress, but we're constantly in stretch types of situations um, where we're, we're learning and growing and building our confidence. And, uh, you know, that means the people we work with, we, we really have to rely on them and their expertise and our, the trust that's been developed um, and those personal relationships so they can support us and sustain us while we're learning and growing in our new role. And we can simultaneously um, support them, you know, as they're doing their work, particularly if we're in a new leadership role where, where we have responsibility for their development. Um, so as I think of it, I, it seems like everything that we do in business uh, and really in any organization requires us to have meaningful 
authentic, genuine relationships with those around us. If they're not genuine, if they're not um, authentic, then what ends up happening is we end up manipulating people. We end up using people uh, and that erodes trust. It doesn't build trust. And when you don't have people you trust, um, then, then ultimately you, you, the only choice at that point is to have more of a fear-based leadership style where you're trying, you know, where you use carrot and stick tactics to try to get people to, um, to comply and to, to do the things you want them to do. That's how you get stuff done when you don't have relationships and when you don't have trust. Um, but that's so limited. That's, you know, when you think of um, outcomes for your team or for you personally, if you want to be successful, you, you, you know, relying on a compliance-based mentality and carrot and stick approach uh, isn't going to drive innovation. It's not going to drive um, creativity and new processes and greater efficiencies. It, and it's not sustainable. It, 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 in the short term, you can get things done in a very short amount of time, but in the long term, people will leave. You know, you have to deal with turnover issues and getting good people and retaining good people is going to be really difficult. So it's, to me, it's all about um, good relationships. Uh, and that doesn't mean you need to be best friends with everybody, but it does mean they need to trust you. They need to see you as a person of integrity, someone that they can rely on, someone they know that they, um, that they know you will support them and you know they'll support you. And there's that reciprocity there um, that, that undergirds everything that you're trying to do. And so that when you hit tough times, whether it's you know personal, types of relationships, say in the home, you know, uh, we, before, before the interview, we were talking a little bit about just our, our personal lives and our families and, and yep. some challenges that we're currently facing, right? Everyone yep. has those. And, and so whether it's at home and you're dealing with challenges that you're trying to overcome, uh, or it's in the workplace and you have challenges you're trying to overcome, um, it, without those relationships, you, you can't do it. Uh, you, you, you know, the, the, the human carnage will be too great uh, for you to be able to, to overcome in a sustainable way that will drive personal and, and organizational success. Yeah, what you said is there is incredibly important and then you tied it back into the personal life and that's where I, I learned that skill. And I have as many managers and directors that I've worked with over the last several years, many of them, it's almost like they look through a different lens or they have a paradigm shift whenever I begin to talk about this next piece, which is that, that being curious and caring about their, your, your team members' families. Um, many people just show up to work and they think it's a, a nine to five. You just come in, you do your job, you go home. You know, my life is that life and this is this life and I can just flip a light switch, right? That's nearly impossible to do. Um, if I, if I've been trying to do it for you know, as long as I have, but uh, it just, it never works out that way. You know, I try to think, have this work-life integration, more say. Um, but what I learned as a young soldier, and even when I got into leadership ranks, it's when we take a vested interest in the people that work for us lives. You know, they're struggling, they're going through some things, and, you know, uh, and most of us are senior uh, by age and by experience, and so we're in those positions because of that and there's some young folks that are in your organization that are coming through that are going through the same challenges that you've already been through and even if it isn't even work related um, it can have an impact on the environment and their production and their productivity and obviously we want people to be the most productive and the most efficient because that's good for business but when we take a vested interest in their lives and we become very curious and we begin to add value to their lives. And that's the whole piece about social connection is that you're adding value. Uh, and you, you kind of get to understand what's going on and maybe they can help you brainstorm, help you with some solutions. Maybe not necessarily give them the answer, but maybe they need that help to create that space so they can kind of think through and, and bounce some ideas and some things off of people. Uh, I worked with a, a young woman uh, in a, uh, a company one time, and she had an employee that was consistently coming in late, and it just started. You know, there was a great employee, and all of a sudden they came in late, and she was struggling with, you know, dealing with the the uh, the deficiency uh, at work. And I asked her, I was like, well, why is she coming in late? What's the reason? And they just really never boiled down to it. 
And they just knew that, well, she should be there on time. And I'm like, stop, we're holding it. It's like, yeah, they're supposed to be there on time, but have we ever taken the time to ask why? Like, what's causing you to, to be late? Because there's a great book. Um, I can't remember the title off my head, but the theme of it is, is people aren't the problem. The problem is the problem. People are the solution to the problem. And so when we go back to people, because people are our greatest asset, they can solve problems. Um, and if we treat people as if they're the problem, then that's when those relationships will deteriorate. But to the story of the young woman, what they found out was is her husband had left her, you know, a few weeks prior and she was running late because she had to drop the kids off at daycare and they just couldn't get to work on time because of the time that the daycare opened up didn't give her enough time to get to work and she still had a little bit more of a commute. And so that's challenging. Um, and then we were able to work out a deal to where she was, you know, showed up on time and that, that employee became a very vested employee and really, um, doubled down on their efforts and, and because they actually took the time to help her solve that issue and get through those problems. Um, and it's just really that simple. Uh, we make too big of a deal about some things sometimes and we react before we understand. And you can take that, um, you know, that's one of those great Stephen Covey principles, you know, first seek to understand before being understood. Um, and, you know, and, and putting people first. So. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, we're, we're way too quick to think we know or understand where someone's coming from before even having the conversation. So, so just listening, like having the conversation, listening to them with no preconceived notion. Do you have a requirement that everyone shows up to work on time? Yes. Okay. That's fine. Um, but we, we also need to recognize that people are people and people have, have lives outside of work. Um, and that whether we like it or not, that's going to impact the way they come to us at work. When we treat the, them as human beings, uh, and we can meet them where they're at and try to understand where they're coming from, they will remember that. They will appreciate that. Mm -hmm. And like you said, in this story, in this situation, because you take the time to have that conversation and to try to understand them and try to be supportive, you earn their respect, you earn their trust, you earn their devotion, and they're going to come and be even more present in the workplace and more engaged and perform at a higher level because of it. Just a little bit of investment uh, can have a huge impact uh, on on your people as you try to develop those relationships as a leader. Yeah, I think that's yeah, really probably the most important thing that I can really add to any conversation is that the more a leader is invested in the human capital aspect of their organization from the very top down, uh, everybody has to be invested. Like I said earlier, people are your greatest asset. Things don't move themselves. Papers don't write themselves. Reports don't get done by themselves. I mean, I know we're going through AI and doing a lot of automation, but still people are required uh, to do certain things. And when you're invested in the human capital, you really do create a culture. And, and when they see leaders getting involved and caring, other people get involved and care, and you just strengthen the team and people come together. There was a, a great story uh, uh, I got to experience. Uh, I heard this gentleman talk, his name was Brandon DeWitt, I do believe it's out of MX Technologies, and he talked about um, when he had uh, found out that he had cancer. Uh, the entire company came together over a weekend and did a lot of research while he was gone. Um, letting his family know the news in uh, Illinois. And he's out in Salt Lake City, Utah in Silicon Slopes. And those people came together because he cared about people and he was involved in his worst moment in life, you know, when, when we're, you know, that we got this horrible news and we feel like we're in the bottom of this pit, you know, they came together and did research and helped try to find doctors and other folks, you know, they all came together on a volunteer basis and try to figure out like, how can we help him? And when he came back, you know, uh, his co-founder, which is his best friend, they jumped on a plane, they flew around the world, visited a bunch of doctors for months and months at a time while the company continued to run itself while he took care of himself. Uh, and he was, you know, doing red eyes and running the company at night, you know, in the early in the mornings, you know, they were flying all over trying to figure this out and it's a very rare cancer that nobody had survived for until him and now there's a second person and they're still going through treatments and things but he should have been gone almost a decade ago and he's still around 
and nobody had survived from this. And if it wasn't for the company and the people coming together because of the way he treated them, uh, that one, when the entire company comes behind you to support you in your darkest moment, I mean, that just really goes to show uh, the genuine authenticity that he really cared about his folks. And when he came back and it was all said and done and he began to look back at uh, his company and he's like, why do we do this? You know, what's, what's the purpose of this organization? Uh, he did some research and he found out that suicide was one of the highest, you know, um, deaths in, in, in the world. And he kind of figured it was cancer or some kind of cancer or something, but it really wasn't. It was, you know, people taking their own life. And this is near and dear to my heart because of the amount of veterans that do this on a daily basis. And that's why it really resonated with me. The purpose and the impact and calling are so important. And he realized that most people take their own life because of financial issues. And he was a financial um, tech company. So he had the capabilities of saving lives. And so he kind of just transitioned the organization and the company into a, a impactful company where now they're, you know, uh, trying to help save people's lives. Uh, very impactful story. You know, when I got to hear him speak, when I was there visiting one time through a, a particular business uh, uh, expo. And it's just the, when, when, when you have a guy like that, you know, um, you know, who, who kind of tells the story like that, kind of ties in a purpose, impact, community, uh, you know, authentic living. And it's just, it just really shows you how incredible of a culture and a climate that you can create and what people are willing to do uh, for each other. And I, I just, you know, you can't, those are the companies that will succeed for hundreds of years, you know, and continue to go, um, you know, because uh, we know who those giants are in the community. And that's what makes those companies great is because of that kind of leadership. Yeah, well, what what an amazing story. Uh, Kirby, it has been a real pleasure talking with mm -hmm. you today. Uh, the, t the time has flown by, we're about out of time, but before we part, I did want to give you a chance to share with listeners um, how they could get connected with you uh, and uh, just give us the last word. Yeah, so uh, easy way to get connected with me is kirbyingles.com. Um, that's my website. If you go to kirbyingles.com forward slash leadership dash coach, uh, you'll get on there and actually you'll find a special report that I created about uh, leadership uh, using strength-based methods um, and really, you know, just helping, you know, struggling businessmen uh, who desire a meaningful life and, and, and come forward and, and achieve that and create an impact that's really bigger than yourself. So I take all those years of experience and apply that. And I just think that this is really important. The first thing we have to do is we really have to get in tune with uh, our purpose and what we kind of feel like our calling is. And then once we do that, I think you can really have an impact. Uh, there's a great uh, HR uh, um, article out there, um, our Harvard Review. And uh, all you got to do is Google purpose to impact. They'll give you another resource there. And it's the purpose to impact statement. And it's, there's about six, seven steps in there. And if you go there and you apply those steps, um, that using that tool and that resource has helped a lot of my members and clients get amazing results. Uh, and it's really resonated with the people in their organization. And it's began to spread out. Um, and they've used it not only for their employees themselves, but they've also shown it to their, their bosses and their supervisors. And um, they love the idea of this purpose to impact statement and the process that they go through. And it's created better organizations, frankly. Well, that's, that's great. Um, Kirby, thank you again so much for joining us. I hope listeners will reach out, get connected, find out more about what he can do for you. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week.